in San Diego. And he's going to tell us a little bit about an inspirational story, one that has been a book and one that I actually have read. And if you know me, I'm not a big reader, so it really had to capture my attention for me to do it. And it was an excellent story. And of course, in tradition of this conference, John's first concert was Ella Fitzgerald. So it's tough to beat that one too. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Mr. John Tibbetts. Well, it's been a pleasure to be here with you. If you haven't been properly welcomed, welcome to Texas. Uh, someday we're going to divide Alaska in half, though, and make Texas the third largest state in the Union. And you're going to hear an Alaska story from me tonight. <laughs> I want to do a tiny bit of geography and make a connection, though, if I can, uh, to start out with this group here in this room. And you're going to say, how can I do this? There is a part of Alaska called the Southeast, Southeast Alaska. There's a city there called Ketchikan, called First City, because as you're coming north, it's the first city you find in Alaska. There's an island off from uh, Ketchikan called Annette Island. Ketchikan and Annette are part of the story I'm going to tell you today. But let me focus for a minute on this Annette Island out there in the southeast corner off the coast of Alaska. This island is called Annette, but in 1880s, it was settled by a group that came over from British Columbia, a group of Indians, and this became a Indian community community that is the headquarters or center part of it is Metlakatla. This is, this is really the town of this Indian community. Uh, there's about 1,400 residents right now in Metlakatla. Uh, <coughs> during World War II, though, there was a military base, and there was planes from the Canadian Air Force that were based at the Annette Airfield. So Annette, the airfield, are part of the story I'll share with you today. I actually took this picture myself out of a tiny little airplane in 1963. I had worked on it Okay, what's the connection for this audience, this group? We have Helen Mickle here. She's the manager, uh, CEO of the Tongass Federal Credit Union Ketchikan. About 10, 15 years ago, I guess it was, they first started a branch over on Metla County. Wells Fargo had acquired the one bank that had an existence there, and Wells Fargo pulled out, and no, there was no financial services. So they started this branch. Now they've moved out of the little place that they were initially, and they now have a beautiful new branch. This was partially funded, the process, by a uh, Treasury Department uh, funding, uh, as it were. They got one of these, yeah, put CD, yeah, I'll get it right. Yeah, they got one of the fundings, and uh, now, I told you there was 1,400 people on the island. There are 1,200 approximately members of the credit union. Wow. That's called penetration. <laughs> it's called market penetration. Uh, they have uh, some 165 student accounts with about $9,000 in deposits and student accounts. They do a lot of special activities at this branch for this community. And if you want to think about making branch visits, you have to think about how to make branch visits. You can row or fly. You cannot drive. Uh, uh, Helen's there in the center of the picture and uh, Susan Fisher, who was the uh, CEO when this branch first started. So anyway, I just wanted to make that digression to give you a little uh, geography because we're going to talk about a net in the context of a 1943 story. Uh, this is the story of my father and his experiences. It's a survival story. I tell it as an inspirational, motivational story. There is a handout on your tables that you might think how to apply some of the lessons in this story to your credit union circumstances, and we'll come back to that. Let me just say that the handout is, is important, and we just may run out of time, but I will try and get back to it at the end. Dad was born in 1913, uh, in December of that year, so he's coming up on a birthday, actually. Uh, he grew up largely in Ogden, Utah, lived some time in Cheyenne, Wyoming, lived some time in California, 
Went with the Navy in 1932, served five years in the U.S. Navy, married my mother in 1936, so they would have their 80th anniversary this year. They're both long past, but this would have been 80 years since they were married. And Dad went with an agency of the U.S. government in 1937 that is today's FAA. It was called the Civil Aeronautics Administration in that era, in the 30s and 40s. But that was the agency Dad went with coming out of the Navy. Context, uh, 37, going into the 39 time frame, there was already a recognition in the United States that we might get drawn into a significant war. And most significantly, it might have a very large theater of war operations in the Pacific. And if that was the case, the defensive perimeter for North America was Alaska, a remote territory with a very small population in, in, uh, in the United States. Anyway, in the recognition of the possibility of a Pacific War, there was a quick buildup of capabilities in Alaska. There was a number of projects to build Army and air bases. There was a number of projects particularly to build out airfields. And it was in that context that my father, with many others from the CAA agency, got transferred to Alaska. My parents first lived in Yakutat, and then they moved to Anchorage in 1940. Anchorage was a frontier town. There is no other way to describe it. Some of you may live in places where you think you've got some frontier. This is real frontier. There was one paved street. Uh, most of the vehicles on the streets of Anchorage in this 4041 time frame were either military or government, Weather Bureau, CAA, Fish and Wildlife. I mean, that was, it was government in, in, in very real form. And so you notice that. Now, my parents built the first house that they would own as a couple, and I lived in this house for my first two years. My mother wrote underneath one of the pictures, much nicer when we got indoor plumbing. <laughs> Think about that in Alaska. Hmm. This house actually still stands. It was on the edge of town in those years. It's now right almost downtown in Anchorage today. Now, Alaska was a very sophisticated place, though. We had, we had economy transportation. We had the Prius kind of thing that uh, you think of today. We had our Priuses. And we also had our sports utility vehicles. And we got around pretty well in, in, in those times and those circumstances. I want to introduce to you another entity that's part of this story. There was a company that was doing a lot of these construction projects in Alaska for the Army or for uh, the CAA, et cetera. Uh, that was a company called Morrison Newton Construction Company. It's based in Boise, Idaho at the time. It had been very successful in major water reclamation projects across the West in the 30s and 40s. But in Alaska, they were, were the biggest construction company. And in fact, they had built up the largest air force, if you want to call it that. They had saw something like 15 to 17 airplanes. And the plane in the very foreground of this picture is part of this story. It was a Lockheed Electra, very successful airplane, all metal airplane, pretty elaborate instrumentation, uh, you know, very nice airplane for the time. This was the lead airplane of the Morrison Newton fleet. For those of you who recognize the name Lockheed Electra, Amelia Earhart actually flew a different model of a Lockheed Electra when she was lost over the Pacific in 37. Okay, I want to introduce a character to you. Uh, there's a fellow by the name of Harold Gillum, a very famous bush pilot in Alaska. Harold Gillum became famous in 1929, 1930 when he had been involved in the search for a plane that had been lost in Siberia. And in January of 1930, he actually discovers the plane wreckage in terrible circumstances for flying in an open cockpit airplane. So he had become famous in that time frame. Then, over the next 10, 15 years, he is more well known for his frequency of <clears throat> unscheduled landings, and aborted takeoffs. You gotta get those wording right, okay? So that uh, unscheduled landing, aborted takeoffs. He earned the name as Thrillum, Chillum, Spillum, but no Killum, Gillum. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, he had never lost a passenger despite these <coughs> difficult times with airplanes. Uh, he did lose a flight instructor once, but that wasn't counted against his record. <laughs> he became the chief pilot for that Morris and Newton Construction Company, and he flew largely that Lockheed Electra airplane that we're talking about. All right, a little more geography. You can see where Ketchikan is. You can see where Anchorage is on this, this map. But there's another island I want to draw your attention to. It's a large island out in the Bering Sea. It's called St. Lawrence Island. It was on St. Lawrence Island in December of 1942 that my dad was doing a installation of a uh, aviation equipment uh, uh, a signal system. Why in the world? Again, if you know a little World War II history, we were shipping airplanes from mainland United States, places like Detroit, across Canada, across into Alaska, and from uh, Fairbanks, Alaska to Nome, those planes were flown by Russian pilots who would then take them across the Bering Sea and over to Siberia and then to the uh, uh, war fronts uh, along Russia-German borders. So we had a lot of aviation activity occurring across the Bering Ocean, and that's the reason Dad was there on St. Lawrence Island. Anyway, uh, Dad gets a telegram, December of 42. It's from uh, his sisters. Dad was the uh, uh, eighth child, seven older sisters. So the sisters are sending him a message saying, your mother has had a stroke or a heart attack and she's not expected to live. Is there any chance you can get home to see your mother before she would pass away? Think about the geography, but he gets that on St. Lawrence Island. He makes his way back to Anchorage, makes some scheduling to do some CAA business in Seattle and then works his way towards the uh, last 10 days or so of December to get back to Ogden over the Christmas holidays to see his mother. He gets a chance to visit with her. She may or may not have recognized him. She was pretty uh, difficult circumstances at the time. Then he makes his way back to Seattle uh, towards the end of the year. And on December 31st of 42, he writes a message to my mother. He says, Alta, I miss you and love you. God speed our quick reunion, and I hope I beat this letter to you. As we get through the story, you'll see that he did not beat the letter to my mother. This hotel where he actually wrote this is still standing there in Seattle. It is a Fairmont Hotel, uh, Olympic Hotel as it was called in those days. Now, they had to get back to Alaska, so there's a scheduled flight to go on January 5th that would uh, leave from Boeing Field in Seattle. This field is still in operation today as a uh, general aviation and as a Boeing uh, corporate field as well. But anyway, uh, uh, they had the normal things to deal with that you and I have today. They had traffic and traffic congestion. Okay, it's not a new phenomenon. A lot of military vehicles, a lot of military installations along the Seattle corridor, along the coastline and the uh, protection of Japanese submarines that were off the west coast. Uh, so he dealt with traffic. Uh, and then he deal, uh, dealt with uh, the equivalent of our TSA. You thought that was a new invention. Well, <laughs> Alaska was a territory. Alaska was really controlled as much as anything in that era by the Defense Department. And so there was a lot of hurdles to clear. It's sort of an immigration and nationalization kind of process just to go from mainland U.S. to Alaska. So they had that hurdle. And then they had the third typical aviation hurdle, and that is the mechanical delay. While walking around the Lockheed Electra, the Harold Gillen spotted that there was a slight oil leak, but that was easily fixed with a little duct tape and shellac. Uh, the plane was fixed and they were ready to take off. All right, there were gonna be six people on the airplane that day. Uh, in the front left seat, of course, Harold Gillum. In the front right seat was a fellow by the name of Robert Gibo. He was a Morrison Newtson uh, construction superintendent. He acted that day also as the co-pilot, the navigator, and the flight attendant. So he was, like a lot of you folks, carrying multiple hats. Behind him was a young lady by the name of Susan Botzer, a brand new employee of the CAA, uh, followed by the name of Percy Cutting, or Sandy Cutting, who was a a mechanic from Morris and Newton coming back from the Christmas holidays with his family. And there was a fellow by the name of Dewey Bedstorff, a hotel operator in Anchorage, and then my dad with the CAA. 
On the left side of the airplane, as you're looking at this diagram, that was luggage and auxiliary fuel tanks. They were going to travel from Seattle to a net airfield for refueling, and then they were going to fly the rest of the way up to Anchorage. That was their plan. They get airborne over a Vancouver Island. Uh, Robert Gibo gets up out of his airplane, his, his co-pilot seat, and he does his flight attendant duties. He passes out some sandwiches and some fruit uh, to the passengers. Uh, they experience a little bit of turbulence and a little bit of sleet snow as they're getting towards the Alaska border. Nothing that they can't handle. Airplanes of that kind can handle that weather. That was not a big problem. Uh, they did have a second problem, and that is that uh, Harold Gillum had failed to update his charts, and because of the Japanese being off the coast, some of the uh, radio frequency signals were changed from time to time to sort of confuse the Japanese. The problem was that day that was confusing Harold Gillum. He didn't know exactly where he was. Again, that's not a serious problem. You get down below the, uh, the cover, you spot some uh, terrain that you recognize, you can find your way into a net, that wouldn't be a serious problem. So problem number two is okay. Problem number three was not okay. He lost power to his uh, right engine. With the engine stopped, today we can fly on one engine on most airplanes. You couldn't do that in that day, and they started losing altitude. Harold Gillum picked up the mic and he shouted out, one engine has conked out, expect trouble, and he dropped the mic. He navigated as best as he could as he would reduce altitude, trying to spot something that would give him some degree of a, uh, either a safe way to get down to the water or otherwise find a safe landing uh, crash site. Could see nothing. He just saw mountains around him from every direction. And at 6.30 p.m., they crash into a mountain. Now, mountains are not very tall in that area, but they're steep because they're coming right up out, straight up out of the water. Uh, they're about 25 miles south of Ketchikan, a little bit to the south and east from the net airfield. But uh, this mountain was their undoing. Now, Gillum tried to do a couple things as they were starting toward the crash. He did turn off the power to the still functioning engine to reduce the chance of fire. He tried to pancake into the mountain that he might land on the belly that wasn't really successful. They still got some trees, but the trees actually were fortunate because the trees tore off the right wing of the airplane and maybe slowed it enough that it, when it impacted, it didn't crash. It also crashed over a ravine where the snow was deep, the tree debris was deep. There was probably some level of cushion. Anyway, Dad described the crash as it was like being in an explosion, a shuddering impact, the sound of crushing metal, blindness, and extreme pain all at the same moment. They were all badly injured. Dad got up and was, found himself really ejected out of the fuselage. He was feeling the uh, rain or sleet on his head, uh, or snow, whichever it was at the time. Uh, that's what woke him, and he heard the sizzle of heat against the snow, started shouting out, gradually got responses from most of the people. Gillum was able to get up out of the pilot seat, wake his way back. He and Dad pushed out Jeebel and Medstar just pushed them out of the airplane and they rolled down the mountain. They were badly injured, uh, but they were worried about fire. Uh, cutting gate up, Gale got up, but he must have had some kind of whiplash and he fell back down, was unable to get back up. But the biggest concern was Susan Botzer. Susan Botzer had, uh, had severe injuries of several kinds, broken bones, and her right arm had largely been wedged between the seat and the fuselage of the airplane and severed. And so it took a long time just to free her from the wreckage. She was losing a lot of blood and must have had also some head injuries. They laid her down and took care of her as best they could, but she died on the second day after the crash. <clears throat> they did a lot of things they could to try and take care of this. First of all, they realized that under the left wing of the airplane, there was a gap. They could dig out the snow and the rocks and the tree limbs, etc. And they built themselves sort of a cave underneath that left wing of the airplane. And then they brought the tarps from the airplane, engine tarps, wing tarps, put them over the front of that cap that they had cleared out and made sort of a cave. Then they brought out the seat cushions and the blankets and the pillows and their clothes and anything else that was on the airplane and made that cave somewhat livable. 
They had some level of food. They had, uh, uh, they had some uh, uh, corned beef. They had some sardines. They had some bouillon cubes. They had some tea and some coffee, some modest amounts of food supply. And they quickly started deciding to stretch it as long as they could. So they'd take the sardines and they'd cut it to five parts and you'd have one part of a sardine. That was all you got. They would take the chocolate bars that they found and then they took the chocolate bars and they broke them into the little squares. You could have your square of chocolate for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, but that was your square of chocolate for the day. So they stretched out what food they could. Uh, they had a fire, they got a fire going. They had the advantage of what we call Boy Scout fire water, gasoline. They had a lot of it and so they got a fire going and they were able to keep warm. And they were so warm, Dad puts his shoes next to the fire to dry them out one day and he burns his shoes, and for the rest of this story, my dad's feet are wrapped in rags because he's lost his shoes. One food story of the occasion, dad remembers going into the play one afternoon to search for leftovers from the lunch that they had eaten before the crash. I got down on the floor of the plane and went through it bit by bit, picking up crumbs of bread, frozen grapes, and disintegrated apples. I put them all on something and took this little tray back up under the wing where we were living. Given our circumstances, these little pieces of food were really a treat at the time. I thought for a while that frozen grapes must be the greatest thing since home cooking. I'll go through a couple of the events pretty quickly if I can. This will give you some orientation though as to the geography. You can see where that island is. You can see the crash site there in the lower right hand corner of the screen. Uh, they. Uh, didn't really know where they were at the time, but were just well above a, a large, deep bay called Boca de Cuadra, and uh, were about uh, 25, 30 miles to the southeast from Annette. Newspaper articles, I went through a lot of microfiche reading newspaper articles. This one was only interesting in the fact of how it was uh, that it kind of forecasted some things. The article said about Gillum, he's the best pilot in Alaska and has been lost many times. If anyone knows that the country and can come out of this difficult spot, he can. If anyone can bring his passengers out to safety, it would be him. And Gillum would do everything he could to do that. On Annette Island, there's a rock quarry. On day five after the crash, they heard an explosion. I think more than one explosion, at least twice. And Dad and Gillum knew immediately that was coming from the rock quarry. They probably thought at that point that they were on Annette Island. What they didn't realize in that stillness and cold, that sound was carrying 25 miles. But anyway, uh, uh, Gillum uh, takes some supplies, some uh, flares and uh, a sleeping bag and a few other things, a, a parachute in fact, and he sets out in the direction of that sound, looking for a way to bring rescue to his passengers. He's never heard from again. Now, this is the kind of newspaper that Mother's reading, and I, you don't need to be able to read it here, but it's the kind of headlines, because you read these microfiche records in sequence and you see how little there was to report. Planes either did or didn't get in the air. Planes didn't find anything. Boats searching the area didn't find anything. So you can think how disheartening this is for mother and a little two-year-old who doesn't know what's going on, but uh, she's there alone in my preach and reading these kind of newspaper articles as hopes became increasingly dim. About five days later, day 10, uh, desperate for some successful venture, Cutting, Sandy Cutting, who is now quite able to move about, he's a pretty good outdoorsman, a woodsman, lived, raised in the Northeast in Vermont, what have you. So anyway, he set out to the north from where they were, the opposite direction to what Gillum had done, towards a bay they could see in the distance called Smeaton Bay. They didn't know for sure it was Smeaton Bay at the time, but they could recognize where they were. It takes him almost two days to get down there by himself. Has absolutely no success. Doesn't find any sign of life, any sign of uh, boat traffic, etc. Very disheartening and discouraging. He's getting ready to go back up the mountain. He has one fortunate experience. Now, some of you are old enough to remember the little Abner cartoons of a little character called a schmo. The schmo was a real stupid bird, but I understand it was very good tasting in the little Abner cartoons. Well, he came across five schmo. And these uh, blue grouse, as they were, stood there for him and let him shoot them. And he mm -hmm. gave them each their turn. 
uh, one, two, three, four, five, and they all got shot. He cooked up one and made a meal for himself to give himself some energy to go back up the mountain. But when he rised back underneath that airplane wing, they're all thrilled because they have their first solid meal in a long time. It's now two weeks since they've been lost, and they cook up two of the grouse and save two more for later. They also recognize that though they've had some food, it's been two weeks, whatever search has been going on for them is probably just about terminated. Two weeks at, at, at three at the very most would be the maximum for which a search would go on in Alaska in those times. So they knew that they were going to die probably there on that mountain, either freezing to death or starving to death or both. So they had to do something. And they realized maybe if they could get down off the mountain, they might have some chance be a little warmer, maybe find some game, maybe do something that might have a chance for a better a chance for rescue. They worked their way down the mountain. It's a miserable, miserable experience. We were sliding and crawling. Robert Gibo had limited mobility, walking and sort of dragging his slowly mending leg. Metzdorf was perhaps even more in pain with a broken collarbone and broken ribs. In place, it was almost a vertical drop. There was no form of a trail. We had to deal with ice and heavy snow and we're constantly climbing over fallen logs, rocks, and low brush. We couldn't carry our packs, just <clears throat> stumbling along, dragging them behind us. We would lower part of our supplies, wet clothing, and so forth, and then go back over the same few feet with the next portion. We were weak and frostbitten, and the trip so difficult and painful that it almost broke us. In fact, they didn't get all the way down on the first day. They got down to a ledge, managed to find a way to build a fire, Two would try to sleep while two would stand. They cooked up the last two of their grouse that night, and then the next day they made it down to the bottom of the mountain. This gives you the mountain view on the right. They're down at the bottom, kind of a pretty little valley. We'll talk about that in a second, but they're about three miles uh, from the Boca de Quadra that I previously mentioned, down through the, that valley to the south. They decided that Dad and Cutting, the two who were healthiest, would try to go to Boca de Quadra to look for the possibility of rescue, and they would leave the other two behind. So they built a lean-to shelter for Metzdorf and Jibo. They left whatever tea and bullion cubes they had left with those two men, and Dad and Cutting set out. Now, you can still see this looks like a doable trail. That's really what they're thinking. Now, in the summer, that would be basically swamp. They have a nicer word for it in Alaska, muskeg or whatever, you know, but it's swamp. In the winter, it's frozen, uh, but it is still miserable country. They were going to hike out. Dad did say that afternoon before we left, there was a terrible snowstorm, which was very discouraged. I went out in the trees in the back of our camp, and I prayed. I prayed so much, it really got beyond the business of prayer. It seemed to be a matter of talking to God and having an understanding with Him of our needs. I wanted to, to know what we should do, and I wanted my wife <coughs> to know that I was alive. I'll digress for a second and talk about Mother. Now, this is now getting close to three weeks. Mother uh, had been disheartened and, and disappointed and discouraged in everything that you would expect. But she remembered saying that... Uh, she prayed so hard, so strongly, that she just had the feeling that Joe was saved, and she kept the home and baby as though he were just away for a few days and would soon be home again. A couple of the local people from friends there, as well as the government employees, went to see Mother at about this time and discouraged her from staying. This was an open water, and they found the beach. Now, I told this story in San Diego, and I showed this is the beach. They don't recognize this as a beach, but this is a typical Alaska beach. Hi, Dylan. Rocks, logs, tides are extreme. During the low tides, you can't walk hardly on the beach because of debris. And during the high tide, it's right up to timberline, so you can't hardly walk there. And so they walked along the timberline on the north side of this little body of water called Weasel Cove. It's a little, little cove of water. Uh, they get out to the uh, bottom of this picture, as you're seeing it on the screen, the bottom of this picture. And they're looking across at a place called Weasel Point, and they see a cabin. They're on the wrong side of Weasel Cove. But the cabin might be a source of something of value or rescue for them. So they build themselves a raft. Well, they tie, they tear up a blanket, strip, 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 tie some logs together, build them a little raft. 
Well, the raft didn't function like a raft. It functioned more like a teeter-totter. The one in the front would go down, the one in the back would come up, and vice versa. So Dad jumped off the back, and Cutting took it across towards the point, almost like a surfboard, and got himself across. Uh, over there, he found it, this cabin. It was reasonably a, a, a good shelter opportunity. It's largely down at ground level now, but you can still see some remains of the cabin today. He found uh, uh, two or three things of value. There were some coffee tin cans. One of them had some rice in it. The rice was now full of weevil, bugs, but it was rice. The other can had some tar in it, dry tar, but it was tar, it might be of some value. And he found a little dory, a little boat that would be dragged behind a fishing boat, a little, little, little tiny rowboat. And it was largely beat up and uh, unwater worthy, but it was a boat of some kind. So he gets back on his raft, towing his boat with his two coffee tin cans and makes his way back to Dad. Now, in the course of the event, winds came up and tide changed. And so there was a long interval here of about 45 minutes. The two of them couldn't get back together. Dad finally had to wade out and pull, cutting back into the shore. But Dad had something going on at the shore that's a special part of this story. He had a fire. I use an Altoid box for the illustration here, but he, it was a bullion cube box in which they kept their matches. They kept dry matches. And he had a fire going, so they quickly took the rice and wheel and had a protein and carbohydrate meal. <laughs> Almost a balanced diet. Then they took the tar, mixed it with snow, and stuffing out of one of their sleep bags, sleeping bags, and made a sort of yuck, a glue. Go on, go on, whatever. You and they started patching the cracks in their little boat to make it semi waterworthy. Then they get back in the boat with their now largely empty coffee tin cans and they bail and row and bail and row and make their way over to the cabin. And just to make the day even that much more special, a couple of crows uh, land. As if in answer to prayer, several crows flew down and lighted on a rock near us. Given the beating that our rival was already having had, we didn't know if it worked, but Sandy's aim was good, his hand was steady, he shot three of them forthwith. We immediately set to work to eat them, all but the feathers. We didn't wait long to roast them either. They were just slightly warm through. There's not much to them, but I never knew anything could be as delicious as roasted crow breast. Mm. In our circumstances, it seemed like turkey legs. Dad had a good personality and a good sense of humor. Again, for orientation, Weasel Point there is at the center of this picture. Weasel Cove off to the left, a place called Badger Bay off to the right, and Boca de Quadra in the foreground of the picture. Looking to their south, down Boca de Quadra, they could see an old abandoned cannery, having had some limited success with this cabin. Maybe there was something of value there at the cannery that they could head that direction. So they get in their boat, and they have about an 11 hour round trip day down to the cannery and back. Rowing, bailing, etc. When they get to the cannery, they find nothing of value. Old newspapers, that's all. They did see, or didn't see, they were looking for rats, really. If they'd seen a couple rats, they had rat stew in mind. Uh, they did find a vat of oil, but the vat of oil said, do not burn, and they're good American citizens, and this is a war, and oil is valuable, and I think the cold had gotten to their brains. They didn't set the oil on fire. That might have actually given them some signal that might have been seen. They turn around, and they row all their way back to the cabin. Disappointing day. But they were encouraged. You know, sometimes when you're successful at something, you think, Oh, the next day is going to be better, okay. Uh, they looked to the north out from where they were at Weasel Point and to the other end of Boca de Cadre. They could see where it entered into the more open sea. Maybe they'd go that direction and there would be a better chance of uh, drawing attention to themselves. And so Dad says they had a warning that day, sort of a mental, emotional, an answer to a prayer, whatever, a warning that maybe they shouldn't do that, but they couldn't come up with a better idea. So, okay, cast out the warning. We're going to go do this. And they take off to the north. Uh, they were only in the water for about an hour and a half, and a large storm came up. 
Didn't take much, with only two or three inches of boat above the waterline anyway. Boat was swamped out from underneath them and they're left in the water. Dad says, our clothing dragged us down. The waves tossed us around for just a moment. I lost all faith and was angry with the Lord. Why, I thought, have you let me go through so much for so long, only to drown here today? But almost as I completed that thought, with my head barely above the water, I found my feet touching the bottom. So, along the bottom, bouncing off the bottom, they make their way over to the shore. This is what the shore looks like right there. About 30 feet of straight up and down rock. And you think in a storm, in the cold, that's really just kind of a sheet of ice over the rock. And they have to climb out. And it takes them 45 minutes or so to climb out. They get to the top of the rocks, though, finally. And they do what? They start a fire. They take off all their clothes. They dance around the fire. I saw this postcard, and I thought it was very appropriate. You can't see it. But if you and I had come across them at that moment, we would have thought we had just found Sasquatch and his closest friend. <laughs> Dancing around in the nude, unshaven for three or four weeks, we just, you know, we were going to be on the cover of National Geographic. Think of where we were going to be. Anyway, clothes semi-warm, not dry, but warm. They put them back on and they start making their way. They have three interesting experiences over the next couple hours. One, they do hear some crashing on the rocks below them. They go down and they find the remains of their boat. All gone, really. But they flip it over and under the remains of the boat, under a seat, Dad had put, wrapped in an oil cloth, I really think it was Susan's raincoat. He had some personal precious documents and scriptures. He's able to recover them. They are still there. Secondly, he, uh, they find as they get around towards, they're going to have to walk all the way around Weasel Cove. It was cold enough that day, the cove was largely frozen over. So they were able to walk across on the ice. Something that saved them probably a couple miles of misery. Third experience they have that day is a great disappointment. They see a boat leaving the bay as they're approaching the cabin. Had they stayed at the cabin that morning, they probably would have been rescued. This is a kind of a map to give you a little geography lesson there. You can see where the crash site was, where they left Chibo and Metzdorf, where they had gone down to the cannery, and then where they had gotten dumped out in the water in the bay. They found another opportunity for a meal. They found some measles, some mussels on the beach. They thought they might be poisonous. They were worried they might die. They ate a few. They didn't die, so they had some more. That mussel bed, or colony, whatever you call it, is still there today in the same spot. A day later, Dad sits down on February 2nd, 1943, to write the letter to Mother that he had put off writing. He said, uh, I have been going to write a note for four weeks, but I have had and do have so much faith that it won't be long until we're together again that I thought it unnecessary. I still do. It's an interesting letter, it's a personal letter, it gives some instructions to mother what she should do. But I get a kick out of telling the first, one of the first parts of the letter. Uh, Dad had been the lay leader, uh, what was called a branch president for a little congregation of Mormon, or Latter-day Saints in Anchorage. And the first part of his letter starts out with mother saying, here's how to make sure the church books are all balanced. You think about it, if you're gonna meet next, uh, St. Peter somewhere in the next couple days, you might want the church books to be just about right. Well, that was the first instruction he gave to mother. Other instructions are very personal and very sacred. Anyway, uh, they are back at this cabin. Weather's bad. Not much chance of food or rescue now. Very distressed. And they hear out in the bay a boat coming into the bay. The boat was a very small uh, fishing boat had been commissioned to be part of the U.S. Coast Guard Reserve during the war. They had like five on board. Uh, they were doing some site monitoring of, of different things in the bay. Dad and Cutting do what? They build up a giant fire on the beach. Now, at some GAC meeting or something, I slip off to the National Archives and I read the ship log of this little fishing boat and the, fishing, the captain there says, Fire at Weasel Point, probably trappers or hunters. And he doesn't care about trappers or hunters. 
chief goes on down the bay. Dad and Cuddy have no idea where it goes. Remember how in the winter Alaska, it gets dark early in the <coughs> afternoon and stays real dark. And so they didn't even know if that boat was still in the bay at all. And the captain really wasn't worried about that fire that, he, that he'd seen. Next morning, ship log reads, woke the crew, shoveled the snow off the boat, had breakfast, fire at Weasel Point, probably trappers and hunters. But this time, the captain, or skipper as it were, was a little bit more curious, and he heads over in that direction, and at about 9.45 in the morning, he puts his rowboat in the water, and Dad and Cutting are rescued. Jan February 3rd, 1943, 29 days after the crash. Uh, the people on the boat were stunned. They had known about the Gillum plane loss. They had assumed everybody was dead. And this was, they brought them on board. A fellow who died just a year and a half ago, Leonard Olson, told me, he said, we got put him on board. He's a Norwegian guy to die, a fisherman. We got them on board, we fed them pork chops, we got them warm and dry. You know, he's pretty frank in his summary of the occasion. They couldn't get a signal out, they had no capability to go to look for Jibo and Betstar, so they head toward Ketchikan. And uh, from Ketchikan, though, messages start going out. And they're, they're really wonderful messages, uh, you know, it's the newspapers, etc. But in the CAA offices in Alaska, this is what happened. Needless to say, work became at a standstill. Never have I seen such a display of happy relief. Men were weeping unashamedly. The girls were laughing, crying, shouting, and embracing one another. <clears throat> Play, the articles in the newspaper indicated that they're now unaccounted. Three people, Gillum, two that had been left behind. Hope would be for the three. Fellow by the name of Fred Hill was charged with the Coast Guard of organizing a shore party to go in to look for the other two. I interviewed Fred Hill before he passed away. Fred said, I wasn't real excited about my assignment. Probably gonna go find two dead men. And then just to top it off, as I'm getting ready to go, I find out that they're gonna send tippets and cutting with me. They're insisting on going to find the companions they left behind. I'm probably going to be responsible for four dead men. Now, he was 86 or 87 at the time, and he's still angry that he got this assignment. Uh, they get on board the USS McLean. Uh, Dad's there at the top of the picture. Fred Hale's there at the very far right of the picture. He's not a happy camper heading in to look for Chibo and that story. <coughs> this is a bit on the trail as they're, they're going in. Uh, it takes them about... Uh, uh, several hours, and they don't find them that day. That day, number 30, Dad was rescued on day 29. This day, they don't find them. They're shouting, they're swiring off guns, etc., hoping to have some response. They get none. These two men were so near death that they had put their names into their hat bands so that their human remains would be recognized when they might be found. And they were unable to respond, but the next morning they were found. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Medstorf after he had been changed clothes, they moved the, the campsite up further into the tree line. That's Fred Hill with a smile. So I do know at some point he got over his unhappiness. And uh, he's seen it. Now, with Dad at the time, Dad had lost every bit of adrenaline that he had. His two companions had now been rescued, and he has to get back out again, which is another long adventure. He almost had to be carried of his exhaustion and his, his condition. But another shore party coming in intercepted the ones that were taking him out, so there was enough people to help carry and drag and lift, uh, cutting and tippets to get them out. The next two days, there's a sequence of events, a uh, lot of things. Uh, there's airplanes flying over, dropping supplies. The shore parties on, on ground, pharmacy mates and others who were there working with the two men to try and get them uh, some added strength. They didn't have uh, cell phones even radios. This is the way they gave out messages. They stopped a message in the snow. You can see the message send blimp. The nearest one was down near San Francisco and it wasn't coming, but it seemed like a good idea. They didn't want to hike out again. Another one of the messages there is bandages. They needed bandages. You can see some of the uh, shore party people at the very bottom of the picture as they're working their way across the snow. The campsite had been moved up to the right corner of your picture. You can see the, some folks there at the tree line there. 
One of the neat little pieces of this story, not this airplane, but a small two-seater airplane, was assigned to get an ax to uh, the people on the ground. So they put an ax in the back seat of the two-seater airplane, open the canopy, fly over the site, do a complete roll, drop the ax with a red tail behind it. It sinks down in the snow. The people on the ground go out and get the ax and go to work. They did everything. On day uh, 33 after the crash, two days after the, these two men were found, they take them out. It was a tough haul, starting about 11.30 with Jibo on an improvised sled, followed by bed store strapped to a toboggan. On level parts, the snow was waist deep, and those without snowshoes sank at every step. The hills were worse. Jibo and Metzdorf, tied to their heavy conveyances, had to be lowered over cliffs, hand carried down a waterfall, lifted over slush covered streams. At times, the rescuers had to form a human chain to ease the two men down steep slopes. They finally arrived at the shoreline of Badger Bay. About 4 p.m., the rescuers and survivors were on board the McLean. In this same short time frame, Yellum's body was found. He had made his way down to the shoreline near where Cutting and Tippets had climbed up on those rocks. He had recognized he probably wasn't going to make it through that particular night. He had placed his boots on poles so that if his body got buried under the snow, his body could be found down face below the boots. He had hung a piece of red material on a tree limb above where he thought he would pass away again. And by that markings that he left, his body was found. Mother's story, again, got a lot of press across the country, as did the whole story. Dad and Cutting said spent several days in Ketchikan in recuperation. Uh, about uh, a week and a half, two weeks later, Dad returns to Anchorage. The neat thing I find in this particular picture is between my mother's two ears, there's probably the biggest smile, you know, you can imagine. Obviously, she's thrilled to have Dad home. The little two-year-old, I understand, was really thrilled as well, but he didn't realize he was about to lose his place in the double bed that he had enjoyed for the last two months, and that was going to be distressing to him. Uh, we were in Alaska until 47. Dad was in another crash in Alaska in 1946. Uh, he was in the front right seat of this airplane. He just got up and walked out going forward. He said, nothing injured but my pride. Uh, it got to be known in the CAA at the time that flying with Joe T might be just a little exciting, but you'd be all right. <laughs> I'd take a chance. In the 60s, Dad became the head of the FAA for the Western States, some 7,000 employees. This is a picture with him there on the left. Uh, it's on your left if we look at it, yes. And, and Najib Halabi, who was the head of the FAA at the time. Dad was always a great supporter of the credit union. <clears throat> One guy who was with Dad once said, uh, I, 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 at lunchtime he suggested we have a bite. We got into Thunderbird. I teased him a little about this high quality of transportation, and he informed me, well, don't get the impression that this is my car. It belongs to the credit union, and they have been awfully nice about letting me use it. So he was a credit union supporter. In 1967, just a year before he passed away, he received an honorary doctorate degree for public service from Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. Great honor for Dad. The crash airplane is still there on the side of that mountain. Over the 70 years, 70 plus years now, the plane has been crushed down every winter by more snow. And so it's crushed almost unrecognizable in the, into the ravine of where it sat. But the fellow who was the head of the CAA at those times uh, there in Alaska said the fact that even four on board the ill-plated plane survived a long, miserable month almost taxes our imagination and proves indeed that faith, hope, and courage and endurance have tangible rewards. The age of miracles has not yet passed. The McLean is still on the water. It's in a museum in Michigan. Dad's name is at the Smithsonian Udvarhazy Museum out by Dulles Airport uh, in Virginia. I'll stop a minute if I can and refer to the handout. I'd like you to take three takeaways from the story if you can. Number one, basic skills matter. A lot of what Dad did and Cutting did, etc., is a result of their being outdoorsmen and Boy Scouts as kids. For us, it's people who understand numbers or relate well to people. 
basic skills matter. Secondly, teams matter. You can do with two and four and whatever what you can't do as an individual. Teams matter. Happy members of your team, diverse members of your team, they matter. And thirdly, on the list, I just add internal things. Perseverance, courage, faith, determination, those things matter too in overcoming and persevering and overcoming challenges. In that little notebook that dad had that I mentioned, uh, he wrote the note to mother, he had a portion of a longer, longer poem, but in this portion of the poem it says, success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt, and you can never tell how close you are, it may be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit, it, when things seem worse, that you mustn't quit. I wish you each well in your challenges. This was only a one month challenge, and it's a survival story for four. Many of you deal with challenges and with people who come to your credit unions who have long term and difficult challenges. But you're there to help them, you're there to help them overcome and rise out of the storm, the challenges of their times and circumstances. Being part of a credit union is a great blessing. It is a chance to serve people and help their lives be better. I applaud you for all you do. Thank you very much. I believe you are dismissed, except we got one notice, a moment of the